can you retire on $1 million? This is how retirees live on $1 million. How long will $1 million last in retirement? A million dollars is a lot of money, but is it enough money? Knowing how much money you need in order to live financially free is one of the most important financial questions you can ask yourself. I got my handy dandy whiteboard because today I want to go over how far a million dollars can actually go. How you use your million dollars is going to depend on a couple of different things. It's going to depend on how you spend your money and it's going to depend on how you actually use your million dollars. So let's start by talking about you using a million dollars to live a million dollar lifestyle. If you want to go out and live that millionaire lifestyle, then you're probably going to keep this million dollars in cash in your bank. That way you can access it very easily. And now what you're going to do is you're going to go out and you want to look good on Instagram. So you're going to buy yourself, let's say a half a million dollar house with cash that we don't have to deal with any mortgage payments. And then you're going to buy yourself a nice $200,000, maybe an Audi R8, a nice supercar. You're going to go on a few vacations. So there's a plane, looks like a plane. And in a couple of years, you are going to be broke. So if you want to live the Instagram flexing lifestyle, then the million dollars is not going to last you very long. This should be pretty obvious. If you're subscribed to a YouTube channel, you understand that it doesn't really matter how much money you make. It's what you do with the money you make. Even if you have a million dollars, you can go broke almost instantly if you don't know how to use your money the right way. And if you're not subscribed to a YouTube channel, you should do that. But this is why so many high paid athletes and so many high paid lottery winners end up broke so quickly is because you make a ton of money, but you don't have any financial education. So what do you do when you make a lot of money? You blow it. Now when you blow all this money you have, you have a bunch of nice things, but you have no money left. This is the majority mindset way of spending money. You make a ton of money and then you blow it on a bunch of nice things that make you look rich, but they keep you broke. And so this is going to be a big no-no when you make a million dollars. Now don't get me wrong, I want you to own a nice home and I want you to drive a nice car and I want you to go on nice vacations, but I want to make sure you can afford it. That way you have cash to live your life financially free. So let's go into the second way that you can use your money. Now let's assume that you have this million dollars, but you're conservative. You don't like the whole idea of investing your money because you don't want to throw your money in the stock market and see this million dollars get sliced in half if the stock market crashes. So you want to be safe and you just put this money in the bank. This is how I grew up learning about money. I grew up in a traditional Indian house and Indian people love saving money. It is like in our blood. And so Indian people make a dollar to spend 20 cents and save 80 cents. Well, in the American culture, it is very common to make a dollar and then spend a dollar 20 with lines of credit and credit cards and loans. And so Indian people are born with that saving mentality. And so what do you do? You make money and then you save as much money as possible and you don't want to invest it because investing is risky. And so you build this huge savings cushion that way you can live wealthy. Now saving your money is better than blowing all of your money on nice cars and clothes, but it doesn't give you the full potential of your money because your money is just sitting there flat and is getting eaten away by inflation. I already made a video where I talk about if you can get rich by being cheap. So if you want to learn more about that, I'll link it for you in the description below. In the financial world, there is something called the 4% rule, which says you take your savings and investments and you add it up and then you live off of 4% of that a year and you adjust it for inflation. So in this example, I'm going to take a modified version of this 4% rule and say that you want to live off of just $40,000 a year, which is 4% of your million dollars you saved up in cash. If you live off of $40,000 a year, then this million dollars is going to last you 25 years because now you're not investing your money. This million dollars is just sitting in your bank account and every single year you're just going to draw out $40,000. So January 1st every year you draw out $40,000 and you live off of the $40,000 for 12 months. If you continue to do that, you will be able to live off of your million dollars for 25 years. After 25 years, you're not going to have any more money. I'm assuming for the sake of this example that this million dollars is just sitting in your bank account and it's not growing at all because right now savings accounts are not paying you anything. So if your million dollars is not growing and you're just pulling out $40,000 a year, then you will be able to live off of this money for 25 years and you will be living a $40,000 a year lifestyle. But this doesn't factor in inflation because as you know, the value of our money doesn't stay the same. That's why $100 today can't buy as much as $100 could back in 1970 because our money is slowly losing value over time because of inflation. 
Now, if we factor inflation into this, and now you're not pulling out $40,000 every single year, you pull out $40,000 this year, and then you pull out a little bit more money next year, and then a little bit more money after that by factoring in a 2% inflation rate. Now, you're not gonna have enough money to live off of this million dollars for 25 years. You're gonna have enough money to live off of for 21 years. So if you want to live a $40,000 lifestyle, then you can expect this money to last you for 21 to 25 years, depending on what inflation is, if you have a million dollars. Now, if you want to live a $100,000 a year lifestyle, you can just adjust the numbers. So if your goal is just to save your money that you can draw cash out of, well, now you can do the math to see how long this money is going to actually last you. Now, this time, instead of saving your cash, let's say you have the minority mindset where you invest your cash and you want passive income. So you invest your money in the stock market for dividends. And I'm going to give you two different scenarios. Scenario one, you invest it in McDonald's, MCD, or you invest it in IBM. So scenario one, you invest invest all million dollars into McDonald's and scenario two, you invest all million dollars into IBM. Now, look, I am just a random guy on YouTube, okay? So don't blindly listen to anything I say and make sure you do your own research. I do not recommend that you take all of your cash and throw it into one stock just because of the dividend. This is just a hypothetical. Some companies in the stock market like McDonald's and IBM at the time of me recording this video make a lot of money. And at the end of the year, they have a whole bunch of cash in their bank account and they just don't know how to invest all this money back into their business. And so what they do is they take this cash and they just give it away to their investors people like you who invest in their stock. So if you go out and you invest in one share of McDonald's or one share of IBM, then you will get these passive income checks called dividends deposited directly into your account. At the time of me recording this video, McDonald's pays a 2.5% dividend, which means if you invest a million dollars into the McDonald's stock, you will make $25,000 a year from your McDonald's investment. IBM, on the other hand, pays out around a 5% dividend yield right now, which means if you invest a million dollars into IBM, you will make $50,000 a year in passive income from dividends. So you still own your investment, but every year you're getting a check from McDonald's or from IBM for doing nothing except just owning their stock. So you don't have to sell your stock to get these dividend checks. You just own the stock and then every three months, every quarter, you are going to get a check from McDonald's or IBM. Before you go out and you start living this $50,000 or $25,000 a year lifestyle from your passive income, remember the government wants their cut, so you gotta pay taxes. Luckily, dividend income has a lower tax rate because the government wants to incentivize you to invest your money and get this type of passive income so they reward you with lower taxes. If you make between zero and $40,000 a year in taxable income at the time of me recording this video, you have to pay 0% of your money in taxes. If you make between $40,000 and $441,000 a year in taxable income, then on your dividends, you have to pay 15% in taxes. And if you make more than $441,000 a year, then you are paying 20% a year in taxes on your dividends. At this point, you might be thinking, why in the world would anybody want to invest in McDonald's where you can only make a 2.5% dividend when you can invest in IBM and make a 5% annual dividend? Well, there's a little bit more to what meets the eye. Over the last two decades or so, the price of IBM stock has stayed pretty much flat. And over the last decade, the last 10 years, IBM stock has actually come down about 10%. So if you invested this million dollars into IBM, it hasn't really gone anywhere. And if anything, if you invested over the last decade, it has come down, even though you're making more money in dividends here. With McDonald's, on the other hand, the price of the stock has gone up fivefold over the last couple of decades. And over the last decade, the price of the stock has doubled. So if you invested this million dollars into McDonald's a decade ago, this would be worth about $2 million. And if you invested into them five years ago, this would be worth about $5 million even though your dividends aren't as big. So you have to understand there's a little bit more to what meets the eye because there's more to investing than just the dividend price, which is why you do not want to make your investment decisions based solely on this dividend percentage. You want to look at the underlying fundamentals of the company and you want to make sure you're investing in a company that's growing, that you believe in for the future, because if you do that, then you're going to make a whole lot more money than just this dividend price. Now, past performance does not predict the future performance in any way, but I just want you to understand this because if you invested a million dollars here versus a million dollars here, then you are going to make less money in passive income for a little while here. But 
you could also pull some of your stock out and sell some of your stock and have some cash and still see the stock growth and still see the value of your million dollars grow while having more cash in your hand. In any case, with both of these examples, you have income that you can use to live off of every single year and you also still have this million dollar nest egg. Now, if the price of the stock goes down, the value of your investment will go down too, but in general, you still have a big chunk of your investment just sitting there invested in one of these companies and you also have passive income that you can live off of without selling any of your investment. The third thing that you can do with this money is you say, you know what, I don't wanna invest my money for dividends, I wanna invest my money in the stock market to see my money grow, but I don't know which stock to put my company in, so I'm just gonna put my money in the stock market and if the stock market goes up, my million dollars will go up and if the stock market goes down, well, I will take that risk. And now what you're planning on doing is taking out a little bit of your profits every single year or taking out a little bit of your equity rather every single year. And if you have profits, then that's just icing on the top. Now, instead of just keeping your money in cash in the bank, you're putting your money to work by putting it into something like VOO or SPY. These are two funds that give you exposure to the broader stock market. VOO and SPY both give you exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. So now if the stock market goes up, your fund will go up and if the stock market goes down, your fund generally goes down. You can draw cash out just like you could in the bank, but now you have a little bit more risk because if the stock market goes down, the value of your million dollars will go down too. To put some numbers on this for context, in December of 2010, VOO was trading for around $110 a share and SPY was trading for around $125 a share. Then in December 2020, one decade later, VOO went from $100 a share to around $340 a share, and SPY went up to $375 a share. So both of these funds saw right around a 300% increase over one decade between December 2010 and December 2020. What this tells us is if you put a million dollars here or here in December 2010, you would have something around $3 million over here. But the issue with that is then you don't have any money to live off of for this decade. So if you live off of 6% of your income now, so meaning in 2010, you take $60,000 out. So now you have $940,000 to invest and you put it here or here, you would still see a profitable growth. That means now you're not taking out 4% like I talked about before, you're taking out $60,000 or 6% or whatever your pool is every single year, and you're still seeing a profitable growth because you're seeing more than a 10% growth on your money year after year after year. So you're pulling out 6%, but your money is growing by 10%, so although you're taking out more money than before, your money is still growing faster than what you're pulling out. In this situation, you have a couple benefits. You get to pull out more cash than you did before, so you can live a bigger lifestyle, and you still have your nest egg, and your nest egg is growing on top of that. Before, when you just saved a million dollars, every time you pulled money out, your nest egg grew smaller, so you had less and less cash available. Now, you're pulling more money out, but your nest egg keeps growing bigger. Now, I know you're probably thinking, but just breathe, just because the stock market went up in the past doesn't mean it's gonna continue to go up at the same rate in the future. You're 100% right. Maybe the stock market will go down. Maybe it will stay flat. Maybe it will go up faster than this. Maybe it'll go up slower than this. There's no way to predict that, but this is the risk you take from you investing your money. And that's also why more risk comes with more potential reward. Now, I should also mention that when you pull out cash in this situation, when you sell your stock and you have a profit, you have to pay taxes on your profits. That doesn't mean you pay taxes on every dollar you pull out because some of this money, this million dollars is yours. So when you pull this million dollars out, you don't pay any taxes. There's lower tax rates that I talked about earlier. If you don't like the idea of owning these paper investments like stocks and you wanna own a tangible physical investment that you can see that will pay you passive income, then you can look into investing in real estate. So real estate is my favorite investment class just because I like the idea of creating passive income through owning a physical asset. I'm trying to draw an apartment complex here, so bear with me. I hope that looks like an apartment. But when you buy an investment like real estate, now you own something physical that you can see, feel, and touch like this property. And now what your goal is, is to own this property and put tenants, people into this property who are gonna live there or use your property. And in exchange for them using your property, they're going to pay you rent 
every single month. So you don't have to do any physical work to earn this income because once you own the asset, you can hire a management company or a property manager to do all the physical day-to-day -day work, but you will get this passive income every single month because people are living in or using your property. And for them to do that, they have to pay you rent. When I invest in real estate, my goal is to get a minimum 7% annual return on my money. So if you invest a million dollars into a property, let's say you buy a small apartment complex, then my goal would be to make $70,000 dollars a year in passive income profits after paying all your expenses from owning this property. So after paying all your expenses, you should be left with $70,000 in your bank account. At first glance, you're making the most money here, but don't forget about taxes because you got to pay taxes on your income. Now, as an attorney, I can tell you that real estate has a bunch of legal tax loopholes that you can use. Now, although I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. So if you have specific tax questions, make sure you talk to a tax specialist in your area. Now, what you can do with real estate here is you could to tell the government, hey, yeah, I made $70,000, but I don't want to pay taxes on all $70,000 because my property is a year older. And so what you get to do if you have a million dollar property is you get to take a $25,000 deduction every single year for the next 30 or so years because the property that you own is just one year older. And so you get to tell the government, I'm only gonna pay taxes on $45,000, even though I made $70,000, because you get to take this deduction called the depreciation deduction every single year for just under 30 years because you are investing in real estate. And that's just one of the loopholes you get for investing in real estate. So if we calculate this out, if you tell the IRS that you made $45,000 in income from your real estate property, you're gonna have to pay around $5,000 in taxes because you don't have to pay social security taxes or medicare taxes you only have to pay your income taxes which means you are going to be left with right around sixty five thousand dollars you made seventy thousand dollars you only pay taxes on forty five thousand dollars and you will be left with about sixty five thousand dollars that you can use to live your life and you still own this million dollar property now, there are some other legal loopholes that you can use in real estate to lower your taxable income even lower, but I'm not gonna go over all of that in this video. Hopefully, you'll see your property value go up, which will add some icing on top of this passive income, but when I analyze my real estate investment deals, I'm looking at this, the passive income. I'm not looking at what potential value this could go up to because I just wanna see how much money I can make every single month. As a quick little tip on this, real estate does have more risk because now you have to physically manage this property and deal with tenants and work with property managers and work with real estate agents and work with contractors so there's more upfront work required and there's more of kind of like a skill set required because now you're not just investing in a company like McDonald's and IBM and letting them handle the investment you are the one managing your investment here so now if we really analyze how far a million dollars can take you it depends on how you use your cash if you just save the million dollars that means you will be able to live off of let's say forty thousand dollars a year and you have 21 to 25 years of money after the 21 to 25 years your money is gone and you have no money left if you invest this money into dividend paying stocks like the mcdonald's or ibm that we discussed then you can expect to make somewhere between twenty five thousand and fifty thousand dollars a year to live off of based on today's numbers and this will last you as long as the company is strong because now you're owning an investment that will continue to pay you dividends as long as the economy is strong and as long as the company that you're investing in is making money. If you invested this money into an index like VOO or SPY that gives you exposure to the general stock market, then we're talking about something like $60,000 a year based off of the historical numbers that we saw. And again, how long will this last? Well, as long as the economy is growing and the stock market is growing. These come with more risk than this, but there's more potential to make more money. And if you invest this money into real estate, then hopefully, depending on where you live, you should be able to make about $70,000 a year in passive income. Again, these are all pre-tax numbers. And how long will this last you? Well. It depends on how good the area is that you invest in. If the location continues to thrive, then you will be able to make money from that property for generations. But if the area that you're investing in starts to tank and people move away, then you might not continue to see the same rental income that you're seeing right now. Everyone talks about how you should follow the 4% rule. That way you can retire wealthy, which says that you need to save up a big enough nest egg. That way, once you retire, you can pull out 4% of your assets each and every year. That way you can retire wealthy, but that might not be the best way for you to actually retire wealthy. 
I'll show you why. According to CNBC, if you follow the 4% rule, you should be able to fund your retirement for 30 years. Let me explain. Over the course of your career, you would work to save and invest your money. That way you can one day have a nest egg, let's say worth $1 million when you retire. Now, when you hit retirement, you should be able to pull out 4% of this, which is $40,000 that you can now use to live off of in year one of retirement. Year two, well, you're not gonna have a million dollars. Now you're gonna pull some money out. Now you're gonna have $960,000 here, and you're not gonna take 4% of this number. You're gonna take this number and pull it out of here, but then factor in inflation, because when the 4% rule was created, it was created back in 1994 by a guy named William Bengen, and back then we had inflation between two and 3%. So if you had 2% inflation, that means now you would pull out not $40,000, but now you're gonna pull out $40,800. That way you have enough money to continue funding your life as well. But what happens now if you're facing high inflation? Because now let's just say instead of 2% inflation, let's assume that you're facing 6% inflation. That would mean that you'd have to pull out not $40,800. You'd go from pulling out $40,000 to $42,600. That means now each and every year, you're gonna be pulling out more and more money which means the, your account size is gonna be shrinking much faster. If you consistently saw 6% inflation, now this wealth that you built up isn't gonna last you 30 years, it's only gonna last you 16 years because you're pulling out the money way faster than you originally thought. Now you might be thinking, but Jaspreet, what if instead of just saving this money and having it not grow, you took this money and you kept it invested? And you could do that with the goal of now seeing this money grow as well as you pull out more money, but then you also risk seeing this money get cut in half if you face a market crash. So now what do you do? Is there an alternative? Because there is an alternative that you can consider as well. Now look, just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm just a random guy on YouTube. I'm here not to tell you what to do, I'm just gonna tell you the things that I see and some things that I do, because I just want you to be more aware, that way you can make more educated decisions for yourself. But of course, if you have questions, make sure you talk to a licensed advisor in your area, and don't blindly trust a random guy on YouTube because, well, investing has risks. I like investing for cash flow, and when you invest for cash flow, you do your investment analysis a little bit differently, because now I start with the end. If my goal is to make $40,000 a year from cash flow from my investments, this is money that my investments are paying me that I don't have to go to work to earn. Now I have to go work backwards to see how much money do I need to invest to actually get this $40,000 a year. And I'll show you how to do this. But if your investments pay you, say, a 3% return, 3% cash flow, not 3% growth in the value of the investments, but 3% of cash flow, which is money I'm getting without having to sell my investments, now I would need to invest $1.3 million to generate this $40,000 a year in cash flow. If I can get a 5% cash on cash return on my money, now I would have to invest 800 grand to generate this $40,000 a year. And if I can get a 7% return on my money, now I'd have to invest $570,000 to get this $40,000 a year in cash flow. Why does this cash flow work? Because now when you see inflation, in theory, you would want to be investing in good assets that are also growing the cash flow. Now, is that always the case? No, but with the right financial education, you can have the right assets, which mean your cash flow will also be increasing when you have more inflation. For example, over the last number of years when we've been facing this high inflation, not only have we been seeing rent prices grow, which means if you're a cash flow investor in real estate, your rental income has been growing, but also in the stock market. If you're a cash flow investor in the stock market, chances are you've been seeing your dividends grow as well. Now, does this mean that rents and dividends always grow? No, when you go through an economic slowdown, rents can get cut, dividends can get cut, but this is where you have to understand the different ways that you can invest your money that we can get paid in more than just one way. Let me start by talking about how you can do this in the stock market. First, by individual stocks, and then second, if you don't invest in individual stocks. Now, I'm not recommending any of the stocks that I'm about to talk about. Bankrate put out an article going over some of their favorite dividend paying stocks. I'm just gonna highlight some of the stocks out of this. So make sure you do your own research, but if you look at the list, number 10 is 3M, number nine is Walgreens Boot Alliance, number eight is Philip Morris, and number seven is 
AT&T. So let me talk about these. Now to figure out if a company is paying a dividend or not, or to see what a company's dividend is, you can just go to a site like Yahoo Finance. And what you'll see that at the time when we recording this video, 3M is paying about a 5.8% dividend. Walgreens Food Alliance is paying around 5.7%. Philip Morris is paying around 6% and AT&T is paying around 6% as well. That means based off of these numbers, you'd have to invest right around $700,000 into one of these stocks in order to generate $40,000 a year of cash flow. Now again, the goal with investing in a cash flow company is that now you're investing in a good company so that when you see a growth in that company, dividends will also grow. And if you see high inflation, the company would also see growth in their dividend potential so that way you would also generate more cash flow. Is it guaranteed? No, but the idea now is you're working to invest to generate cash flow. But then the next question is, how do you research a company? How do you keep up with a company? How do you know if each one of these are a good investment or not? Because the risk is, well, you could put all your money into AT&T and now you're hoping that you're going to generate cash flow, but then AT&T could go bankrupt. Now, not only are you not getting any cash flow, but your money goes all the way down to zero. So you lose all of your retirement money. Now what? Well, there are alternatives to investing your money into individual companies because most people probably shouldn't be in the business of investing their money into individual stocks because it takes the right psychology, it takes the right financial education, it takes the right patience, and most people aren't interested in learning how to do that and maybe they don't have the right psychology to actually implement that. So if you don't want to invest in individual companies or do that research, what's the alternative? Because this can be very risky because now you can see all of your money go down to zero. Well, the alternative would be to invest your money into a fund with the goal of generating cash flow. So let me start by going over a US news article that highlights some high dividend paying ETFs. By the way, if you want to read this US news article or the bank rate article, I'll also link them for you down in the description. A few of the high dividend paying ETFs that this article mentions are SCHD, VYM, NOBL and SDIV. What you'll see is at the time of me recording this video, SCHD is paying about 3.4%, VYM 3%, NOBL 1.9%, and SDIV 13%. Now, before I dive into each one of these, I want you to also understand that you should never make an investment based solely off of what this dividend number is because this dividend number can be very deceiving. Because for example, let's say you were thinking about investing in a company that's currently trading at $100 a share that's paying out a $2 dividend. That's a 2% dividend yield. But then let's say something bad happens to the company and the stock price falls to $20 a share, but they're still paying out the $2 dividend. That would mean that the dividend value has gone up to 10%. Now, if you come in and buy because you see, oh my God, that's a 10% dividend, you're gonna be very excited. But what you don't see is that maybe this company is on the verge of bankruptcy, which is why the stock price is falling and they haven't cut or stopped their dividend yet. That's why understanding the dividend is just one part of your investment equation and you should never invest in anything based solely off of what this dividend is. I also have to let you know as a disclaimer that I am personally invested into SCHD and VYM. Before you invest in any fund though, you want to know what your fund is actually investing in because now when you invest in a fund, you could be investing in hundreds of different companies and you wanna make sure you're investing in a fund that's giving you exposure to the thing that you want. And how do you research that? Well, every single index fund or ETF for mutual fund is going to have a website that explains what it does. So let's go over the different ones and I'll stop by SCHD. At the top of this website, it says that this is the Schwab US Dividend Equity ETF, meaning this invests in US companies that pay out dividends. And the objective is to track as closely as possible the total return of the Dow Jones US Dividend 100 Index. So that tells you what it does. For VYM, you can see that this is the Vanguard High Dividend Yielding ETF. And if you go to the product summary on the right, it says that this provides a convenient way to track the performance of stocks that are forecasted to have above average dividend yields. And then if we highlight the why should you invest in Noble, what it says is that this is the only ETF focusing exclusively on the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats, which are high quality companies that have not only paid dividends, but have grown them for all of at least 25 consecutive years, with most doing so for 40 years or more. And then finally, we have SDIV, which is the super dividend ETF, which says that you want to consider investing here because of the high income potential, because SDIV invests in 100 of the highest dividend paying equities, meaning companies around the world, potentially increasing a portfolio's yield. This is how you would start your analysis to see if any of these funds are investing in the things that you would like. And then you would dig deeper to make sure that the companies that they're actually invested in, again, this is all on the websites for each one of these ETFs. If you want to find them, just go to Google and search any ETF where you can find new ETFs, there's 
so many ETFs out there. Go ahead and find some ETFs and just start researching and that will start to show you what you are actually investing in. Now, just for full transparency, the majority of my investment portfolio is cash flow producing assets and I invest my money in different places. Now, again, I'm not telling you what to do. I just want to be completely transparent so you understand where I come from when I make these educational videos. My number one biggest investments are into my own business, but I don't consider that your passive investments because I'm actively operating and managing my businesses. My next biggest investment would be my real estate investments. I would put that here because I invest in real estate. That's my largest investment. And this is all cash flow producing assets. When I invest in real estate, I'm working to generate cash flow. Then I have my active stocks and that would be me investing in individual companies. And then I have my passive stocks. These are me investing in ETFs and funds through a passive system. Like I was talking about where every week for me, I have a system where money is automatically being pulled out of my checkings account and it's automatically being invested into my portfolio ETFs. This happens for me every Wednesday. It happens every week. It doesn't change based off of what's happening in the markets. And the bulk of my passive investments in the stock market are paying me cash flow. A big chunk of these stocks are also paying me the cash flow. So about 75% of my investment portfolio is cash flow producing assets. So between here and here, about 75% of my total investment portfolio are paying me with cash flow. Then I have some more of my speculative types of investments. Like here, I have my startups. This is a smaller piece of my portfolio where I'm investing in other startups. These don't pay me with cash flow. This is where now I'm investing in these companies, hoping that one day they're gonna be worth a whole lot more money, but they're probably gonna to go to zero or a big chunk of them will go to zero. That's the reality of investing in startups, that most investments will go to zero. Some of them will hopefully grow and make up for all those losses. Then I have some crypto. I own a little bit of crypto. It's a very small piece of my portfolio. That's kind of the fun. I believe in the value of crypto and Bitcoin for the long term. If it goes to zero, well, it's a tiny piece of my portfolio. If it grows, well, that would be nice. And then I own some physical gold. Again, this also doesn't pay me with cash flow. This is my insurance. This is my doomsday scenario. About 2% of my total investment portfolio is gold. So it's a very small piece of my total portfolio, but it's there kind of like insurance to protect me against worst case scenario types of situations. Situations. So now for me, I like cash flow because now I can keep working to grow the cash flow. I am constantly investing my money, like in my passive stock market investments. I'm investing money every Wednesday, and this is working to buy me more cash flow. Then when I get paid with my dividends, these kid dividends are automatically reinvested to also buy me more cash flow producing assets. So it's like a machine that I'm constantly working to buy more of these cash flow producing ETFs, and then these cash flow producing ETFs are buying more of the ETFs every time I get paid. I use a platform called M1 Finance. They are a previous sponsor from Minority Mindset. I like them because they make it very easy to use. They have a lot of free resources to start investing. If you wanna learn more about them, you can use my affiliate link, meaning if you use my link, we will get compensated. You can do your research, find a platform that you like, but if you wanna use my affiliate link, I got that link for you down in the description below. The second way that you can start generating cash flow is by investing your money in real estate. Now, when I invest my money in real estate, I invest my money not to flip my property for a big profit. I invest my money for one reason, which is cash flow, because I can one, predict how much cash flow I'm gonna get way better than I can predict how much a property is gonna be worth in two years. And second, cash flow is much more stable. I'm not worried about future speculation because if property prices fall, oh well. I'm investing for cash flow. So the way that I invest my money, I look for a 7% cash on cash return on my money, meaning for every dollar that I invest, I'm looking for seven cents of profit from cash flow from the property. This does not include appreciation. If appreciation happens, that's icing on the cake. That is the cash flow that I'm getting. So if I was to invest uh, $100,000, let's just say into this property and about this property all cash, I would want $7,000 of profit being deposited into my bank account after paying all of my expenses. And the expenses include your property taxes, your insurance fees, your maintenance fees, your management fees, because I don't manage my real estate myself. I have a property manager that handles all the day-to-day -day work and covers any of the vacancy costs. So now, after you cover all the expenses, that's the type of return that I'm looking for. Now, if you're a real estate investor, you might be saying, wait, how are you getting a 7% cash on cash return on your money? Because this depends on where you are investing your money. If certain areas around the country that are gonna see one to 3% 
cash on cash returns. You have other areas in the country that might be three to five percent returns, and you have other parts of the country that might be seven to ten percent returns, and then you have other areas that will be ten to fifteen percent returns. Now, just like with dividends, you don't just want to look at this return by itself because this doesn't tell you the full picture. Because in real estate, the higher the return can also be the higher the risk. Because now if you're investing in an area that's giving a 15% return on your money, chances are you might have more risk. You might have a tougher time finding a good tenant. You might have more evictions. You might have more crime in the area. You might be investing in an area that's not seeing much business growth. And so you have to understand now that more return also comes with more risk and different parts of the country are going to have completely different types of returns. And this is where now your job as an investor to find the sweet spot for you. What types of returns are you looking for? This for me is where I'm looking right now. Now, could this ever change in the future? Sure. But for me, these are the types of returns and the types of deals that I've been able to find my sweet spot because I look for distressed properties. And these could be physically distressed or financially distressed. A physically distressed property is uh, what most people will call a beat up property. You walk into a property, it smells like crap, the carpet is disgusting, there's holes in the walls, it just doesn't look good. I like these types of deals because now I can come in and find a deal that nobody else wants to buy. So then I get to come in and buy it at a discount and I have a good team in place where we can come in and rehab and turn around the property at an affordable price. And now I get a fully remodeled, very nice looking property at a below market price. That way now I can already increase the returns that I'm getting. The alternative is a financially distressed property. This would be something like an apartment complex where now it was mismanaged, the previous owners had too much debt or they didn't know how to manage the property and now this property is essentially vacant or tenants are not paying or something bad is going on in this property in a good area where I believe businesses are growing and now I would come in, buy this property and I have to put in the work, the time, the money and the effort to turn this property around. And a lot of people don't like these types of deals because, well, it requires way more work and there's more risk associated with it. But if I know the area, I believe that's where businesses are going. I have a good team in place, which took a long time to build because I know a lot of people talk about real estate being this passive investment. You just put your money into real estate and you hand over the keys to your property manager and you're done. It'll, in reality, it doesn't really work like that because for me, when I got started in real estate, I had no experience. I had no one to guide me. I had no one to teach me. I just jumped right in because I wanted to invest in real estate and I made every mistake possible. And it was essentially like a full-time job because I didn't know what a good contractor was. I don't know where to find contractors. I don't know who a good attorney was. I don't know where to find good attorneys. And so it dealt with bad contractors, bad attorneys, bad accountants. And I had to go through the process, which was one, very expensive, but two, very time consuming. But over the years, over more than a decade now, I've been able to build a good team, figure it out and put in the work, which makes it much more streamlined for me. So if you want to invest in real estate, understand that it can provide great returns, but no, you're going to have to go through this hurdle. And this hurdle is one, a time hurdle where you're going to have to put in the work, not only to learn by reading books, but then do the actual work by investing in real estate and making the mistakes and understand that every real estate investor has a bad deal. I made a video of my worst real estate deal ever on YouTube. I covered it. That was to date, the only deal that I've ever lost money on, but it was extremely painful, not just financially, but mentally because of how draining it was. But these are the things that you learn how to deal with issues by going through screw ups, by going through mistakes, by screwing up, by failing and understanding if you're willing to go through that, then real estate investing can be a great tool for you to build wealth and grow your wealth. But it doesn't happen by itself. It takes time, it takes effort, and it's going to take a learning curve through you. And if you're willing to do it, great. But just don't believe all the, it's completely passive, but you don't have to put in any work stuff. It's going to be its own process and it can be a great return, but you have to be willing to go through that process. There are five big money lives that are keeping so many people poor. And I can virtually guarantee that every single one of you watching this video have heard some variation of these money lives before. So what I want to do is I want to start by going over what these money lives are so you understand them. And then number two, I want to go over what you can actually start doing with your money today with actionable step-by-step -step things that you can start doing right now that we can actually start building real wealth for yourself regardless of where you are with your money today. So let's start by going over what these money lies are. Number one is you need a certain degree in order to become wealthy. Number two is that BGBC is the reason why you're poor. That's your boss, the government, big banks, and corporations that these are the things that are keeping you poor. Number three is that you need money to make money. Number four is that money is bad or evil or taboo. You can put whatever you want in those quotes right there. And then number five is that there's just one path to become wealthy. Starting with this, that you need a certain degree to become wealthy. Many of us grew up hearing this 
I did too. I grew up being told that if I wanted to become successful, there was only one way to do that, and that was about becoming a doctor. But if you look at some of the most successful and financially richest people in the world, well, many of them didn't get there by just climbing the corporate ladder. They worked to do something different. They worked to either build a business or they worked to buy assets. That's where wealth is built. Your wealth is built through your financial education, not just your school education. Now, having a bigger income can help, but the real key to becoming wealthy is what do you do with your money? And we're going to be talking about that. Number two is that your boss, the government, banks, or corporations are keeping you poor. Look, you can blame other people all day and night long, but at the end of the day, it is up to you to determine what you do with your money. It's up to you to determine how you spend your money. It's up to you to determine how you invest your money, and it's up to you to determine how wealthy you become. You can blame everybody else in the world. You can blame your mom, your dad, your cousin, Uncle Bunty, Cousin Bunty, whatever you want. But until you start taking responsibility for your finances, it does not matter. You can blame everybody else in the world. It's you that's keeping yourself poor there. Number three is that you need money to make money. That's a lie. You need money to grow your money. You want to go out and start buying real estate. You want to go out and start investing in stocks. You want to go out and start buying businesses. It takes money to go out and invest your money to grow your money, but you don't need that money to actually make your money. If you want to go out and start earning money, what you need is you need the right work ethic. You need to be willing to take risks. You need to be willing to learn. You need to be willing to put in the work. If you have that, you can go out and make money. And then once you get the money, that's when you can use that money to actually grow your money. It takes money to grow your money. You don't need the money to actually get the money. Number four is that money is bad. Look, at the end of the day, Money is just a piece of paper. It doesn't have emotions. It's not good, it's not bad. It just amplifies who you are. If you give a good person more money, they have a tool to do more good. If you give a bad person more money, they have a tool to do more bad. That's why we need more good people with money. Money is emotionless, it's just pieces of paper. And number five is that there's just one path to wealth. You hear this, the same thing with religion all the time. There's only one path to God. Well, let me tell you something about money, okay? Because we're not a religious channel. When it comes to money, there is not one path to wealth. If somebody's coming here and they're telling you, you have to go out and invest in real estate if you want to become wealthy, that is the only path to becoming wealthy, they are selling you something. If somebody tells you, you have to be investing in dividend paying companies if you want to become wealthy, that is the only path to wealth, is to build a dividend cash flow portfolio. They're selling you something. And this is where I want you to understand, you have some people that have become incredibly wealthy by investing in real estate and never touching a stock. You have some people that have become incredibly wealthy by investing in stocks, never touching real estate. You have some people that have become incredibly wealthy through entrepreneurship who have never touched real estate or stocks. There's not one path to wealth. You gotta find the right strategies, the right options for you. And this is why I always say, don't just blindly follow a random guy on YouTube. You gotta figure out what's right for you because that's what financial education is all about. So now, if these are the five lies that keep so many people poor or broke financially, what do you need to actually do? And you can really complicate this, but it comes down to three main keys. Key number one is you gotta work to spend less money. Key number two is you gotta work to earn more money. And the key number three is you take the money that you're not spending and you're gonna work to invest like crazy. Now, before we jump into this, I do wanna let you know that if you stick with me until the end of this video, I'm gonna show you how you can get a copy of my team's ebook, How to Build Wealth as an Investor for Free. So if you wanna get this ebook for free, just stick with me until the end of this video. Now, let's start by going over how do you actually put this in action and how do you start building wealth for yourself? One thing that a lot of people really get confused here is they assume that becoming wealthy has to be really difficult and really complicated and the money management has to be this really intense process, but it really doesn't. It's kind of like building your health. You can get really into the weeds and the nitty gritty of how do you become healthy. You can look into at what incline do you need to walk on your treadmill? What does your heart rate need to be? How many hours do you need to sleep at night? How do you breathe in the mornings? What do you eat during each hour of the day? I mean, you can get very technical when it comes to your health. But at the end of the day, if you want to become more healthy, just eat less calories and exercise a little bit more. And then you can start working towards that. And as you get more into it, then you can start getting a little bit more technical, a little bit more nitty gritty. It's the same thing with money. It becomes very overwhelming when you start to enter the world of financial education because everybody's bombarding you with all these strategies and all these things you need to do. And now it becomes a whole new full-time job of how do you manage your money? How do you spend your money? How do you invest your money? Where do you put your money to work? How should you be earning money? It becomes very overwhelming. But at the end of the day, there's three things you gotta remember if you wanna become wealthy. It really just comes down to this. You gotta spend less, you gotta earn more, then you gotta invest the difference, invest like crazy. So now, how do you actually put it into action? What are things that you can start doing right now? Well, starting with spending less, you have to understand why are we working to spend less? Because I think a thing that people get really confused is 
I want to earn money to have nice things. I don't want to just cut back on my expenses. And you're right. The goal is to be able to have whatever stuff you want, but the goal is to be able to afford this stuff. And at the very least, what you want to do is you want to create a cash buffer for yourself. If you do not have $2,000 saved up, in a savings account, not to go out and buy a TV, not to go out and buy a vacation, but saved up to protect you against an emergency, you are in a financial danger zone. So the very first thing you gotta do before you do anything else, go out and save $2,000 ASAP. And that means if you don't got $2,000 saved up, don't go out and eat at restaurants, don't go out and do anything. Stop buying stuff completely, don't go to the mall. You need to go out and save $2,000 right now because you are in a danger zone because what happens when you don't have at least $2,000 saved up, this is the very bare minimum. If you don't got $2,000 saved up, well, something's gonna happen. Maybe something's gonna happen to your car. Maybe something happens to your apartment. Maybe something happens to your home. Maybe something happens to your kid. Maybe something happens to your health. And now you gotta pay money to fix that thing. And if you don't got the money to pay for that thing, now you gotta go into debt to fix that thing. Now, not only do you have to pay that money back, but you gotta pay that money back plus interest. So now you start living in the cycle of your work and money just to pay back yesterday's bills or last year's bills. And when you're always working just to pay back yesterday's bills, you'll never have a chance to build tomorrow's future. And so you gotta start by saving at least $2,000. Then, once you got the $2,000 saved up, the next thing you gotta do is you gotta work to pay down your high interest debts. This is things like your credit card debt as fast as possible. And the reason why is because your credit cards are charging you 15, 18, 21, 25, sometimes 28% a year in interest. Now, the reason why that's so significant is because here, when we talk about investing your money like crazy, when you're going to put your money into the stock market, if you're going to buy rental properties, now you're trying to get something like a five to 10% return on your money. Those are your goals as an investor. Those are considered good general returns. But if you're paying 15, 20, 25, 30, 30% in interest to your credit card company, but you're trying to get a five to 10% return here, you are losing in this game of money because you're trying to get a five to 10%, but you're paying out 20% or 25%. And that's why when you have this type of credit card debt, it is literally like shackles that is holding you back from ever becoming successful. And that's why a lot of people start blaming people like corporations and banks for keeping them in this situation. But this is where now you got to stop blaming them and you got to stop playing the same game. And that means you got to stop spending money. You got to stop trying to flex on Instagram. You got to stop buying the things that got you into the situation in the first place. Because let me tell you something. Nobody put a gun to your head to go out and buy that Gucci's belt. Nobody put a gun to your head to go out and drive a Beamer. Nobody put that gun to your head to go out and buy that expensive stuff. And this is where now you're going to have to start letting go of some of these expensive things. And this is difficult because, well, people are gonna think you lost your mind. When you start making these tough financial decisions, people look at you like you're the crazy one. What do you mean you don't wanna go to the Gucci store? What do you mean you don't wanna go to the club? What do you mean you don't wanna go to the bachelor party? What do you mean you don't wanna go on the vacation? What do you mean that you don't wanna go out to eat with me on Thursday night? And these are the tough things that you gotta start by making the sacrifices. Now the goal is not to make sacrifices for the rest of your life. The goal is to start kickstarting the process because if you don't have this type of basic financial foundation built, you could never build upwards. You have a lot of people that don't have this that are just like, well, where do I put my money? What stock should I buy? How can I double my money really quickly? And those are the people that end up losing money in the stock market, that keep bleeding money here and wonder why they'll never become wealthy and they just keep hating their boss, their government, the banks, corporations. They hate the entire system because they don't understand what to do with their money. And this is where now I want you to take a breath and understand the first step is you gotta control your own spending. And that means if you have a spending problem, you gotta sit down with your spouse if you have one and you gotta figure out how you can solve this. Now you can watch as many videos as you want about how to do it. At the end of the day, you just gotta stop spending spending money. Okay, if you don't need it to survive, stop spending money on it. If it is a luxury, see if you can sell it or downsize. Downsize your car, downsize your apartment, downsize your home, downsize whatever you can, sell some stuff and stop spending the money that way you have extra money here. Then when it comes to earning more money, this one is a little tricky because depending on your personality and your mindset and your attitude towards your work, Either this is gonna be very difficult or it's gonna be not that difficult. For most people, if you're working a job, if you don't like what you do, this is gonna be very difficult because that means you might be, have to work harder, maybe that means you have to get a second job, maybe that means you have to get a new career change, and it just seems like work. And this is where I think it's important to understand that there are ways 
to find a career that make you feel fulfilled. And the interesting thing about this is when you do something that makes you feel more fulfilled, you're gonna have way more income potential. And I can give a little example of this because I'm an attorney. I'm a licensed attorney, I don't work as an attorney, but I am a licensed attorney. And one of the most difficult periods of my life, and the one of the most boring periods of my life, and one of the most periods where I was sleeping more than ever was when I was studying for the bar exam, when I was studying to become a licensed attorney. I didn't want to be an attorney. I went to law school to make my parents happy because I didn't become a doctor. So I made this compromise that I'll just go and become an attorney. Well, I go to law school. I did good or I did okay. I passed law school. I uh, actually, actually did pretty decent in law school, but I, I uh, then had to take the bar exam, which is a very difficult exam. You study for months to take this bar exam. And it was so draining because I knew this wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew that I was not going to practice as a traditional attorney and I just had to get through this process and I was spending so much of my time, energy and just brain effort trying to learn something that just wasn't that important to me at that time. So it was tough. I was sleeping a lot and it was just tough. But now when I work, when I work for Briefs Media, my company, when I do videos for Minority Mindset, I can get up excited. And I can work a lot longer and not feel drained. I don't feel that same burnout that I did when I was studying for the bar exam. And it's because I actually enjoy what I do. The whole purpose of this rant was essentially, if you want to be able to earn more money, many times that it requires you now to, number one, work harder. And then number two, work smarter. You have a lot of people that say, don't work hard, work smart. That's stupid as well. You have to be willing to work hard. Anybody who tells you that you can make six figures a year by doing nothing except sitting on the laptop is selling you a program. It's hard work, okay, to earn more money. Now, how do you go out and earn more money? This one, again, is going to depend on you. And if you are an employee, maybe that means a career change. Maybe that means working up in your company. Maybe that means getting a second job. But for those of you who are not that employee-minded, maybe you don't want to be an employee. Maybe you're an employee that wants to get out of that uh, system. Maybe you are an employer. Maybe you are an entrepreneur already. This is where now you got to find something that you can enjoy doing and monetize at the same time. I never really worked a traditional job. I've been fortunate for that. I've always been uh, that entrepreneurial mind. I graduated law school and then I never worked as an attorney because my business was uh, fortunate enough to be able to support me. But for me, the thing that had helped me earn more was working hard in my business. Number two, learning consistently how to grow and scale. And then number three, as we started to make money, to take the money and pour it back into the business. And this one is tough and I'll tell you exactly why. Because on the internet, you have this thing where when people make money, you've got to show it off. Now, this is for all kinds of people across all incomes. It doesn't matter if you are an employee or an employer or a self-entrepreneur or a solo entrepreneur. Everybody feels this need to show it off. And then the internet, digital entrepreneur space, people feel the need to really just show off the numbers. Oh, first time I made six figures. And when I made six figures, I bought this car. When I made half a million dollars a year, I bought this. When I made $700,000 a year, I did this. When I made a million dollars a year, I did this. And I'll tell you that the first time I made a million dollars, the first time my tax return showed them a business made a million dollars, I walked away with $20,000. That was the money that I took for myself. The other $980,000 went right back into the business. Now, I could have taken out way more. I could have taken a whole lot more, bought a nice car, gone out on a whole bunch of expensive vacations, done a bunch of nice fancy things and expensive things. But that's not what I wanted to do because I wanted to build a bigger business. So, if you're working to earn more money, you got to just understand, you got to be willing to invest in your income. That's really what ultimately comes down to. If you are an employee, that means investing in how do you earn more money. Maybe that means taking classes on how you can get a better job. Maybe that means getting a career change. Maybe that means getting a certificate. Maybe that means working harder to earn more money. Whatever it might be, you got to start investing in that income. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Now, I don't have a whole bunch of experience here because I never really worked as an employee, so I don't want to go deeper into that side. But even as an employer, same concept. If you're working to build your own business, if you're working to build your own income, you got to be willing to invest in your income. Take classes, get coaching, get consulting, go out and keep learning, trying things, risks. I mean, the problem is you will lose money with some of these things, but the goal is to be able to increase that income by learning and learning how you can increase that income. 
Now, as you spend less and you earn more, the fastest way to increase your wealth is to increase your income faster than you increase your spending, period. The reason why so many Americans are broke is that anytime you get a raise, you also inflate your lifestyle. I mean, if you ask out 100 Americans, what would help you in a financial situation today? All 100 of them would say, oh man, if I just got a $10,000 raise, all of my financial problems would be solved. I'd have more money to invest, more money to save, more money to buy groceries and whatnot. But what we've seen happen statistically, and I'm not just saying this, I'm saying statistically, is that when the vast majority of Americans go out and make more money, they end up in a bigger financial hole. How do we know this? Because when Americans go out and they get more money, they go out and they buy a faster car, they buy a bigger home, or they go on a vacation to celebrate. And then many times now when you make more money, the bank also looks at you and they say, oh, now you make more money, huh? How about another line of credit? How about another credit card? How about a bigger debt line? You qualify for more debt as you make more money as well, which makes it easier for you to go out and spend more money you don't have also. And that's why so many people end up in a bigger financial hole as they start to make more money, which is why as you start to make more money, keep your lifestyle small for a little while. I call it like a six month delay. Don't increase your lifestyle at all for six months. Just take that extra money and invest it. And then when you get the next pay raise, well now you start living off of the previous pay raise. That way now you can keep increasing how much money you invest. I mean, that's a simple way that you can just accelerate how much money you invest is that when you start making more money, do not inflate your lifestyle. That will allow you to increase your wealth much faster. And unfortunately, most people don't do that. So now you start earning more money, you start spending less money, so you have more money to invest. Now what do you do? You gotta invest this money like crazy. I call this a decade of sacrifice. Because many people assume that when you start investing, you're gonna be able to reap the rewards of your investments tomorrow or next year. That's not how it works. It's like planting a farm. You can plant the farm right now, but you're not gonna get your fruits tomorrow. You might have to wait a year to really start seeing the, the rewards of what you planted, maybe even a few years, depending on what you're planting. And this is where now you gotta understand, investing is a long-term game. The people that build the real wealth with investments are not people that are investing for six months, or even six years. We're talking about for a decade or more. And I call it a decade of sacrifices because it takes time to number one, start putting this system to work to spend less and earn more, to then put the money here, but then it also takes time to let your money compound and grow. Now, like what I was saying earlier in this video, there are so many ways to invest and they can get very, very, very overwhelming because now you have everybody saying, oh, you got to invest in index funds. No, invest in rental properties. No, invest in ETFs. No, invest in real estate syndicate deals. No, invest in uh, these types of ETF mutual funds or derivatives or options or no, go out and start investing in startup companies. It can get very overwhelming. And now you have all these options. You don't know where to start. But the key is you just got to get started. Stocks, real estate, and businesses have been time-tested to prove and build more wealth than any other asset class. So now, just figure out what are you interested in and where are you willing to start. If you want to start investing in the stock market, it requires the least barrier to entry and the lowest amount of money to start. I mean, you can start investing your money in the stock market with as little as a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, it doesn't matter. And the nice thing is there are funds, things like ETFs or index funds, i got other videos on my channel that will go over what those are, that will give you exposure to things like the total stock market. Because what ends up happening next is people will say, oh, what company should I invest in? You start going to Google, what's the next hot stock? What's the next Google? What's the next Amazon? And now when you do that, you're trying to find the next hot company, and now you turn into a trader trying to find the next hot flip, the next hot stock, and that's why so many people end up losing money is because when you start investing in companies without understanding what the company is or what the fundamentals are or without actually trying to invest for the long term, well, now, you're one of the people that ends up losing when the markets start to go down. And you gotta understand markets don't go straight up. But if you just invest in the stock market and you keep putting more money into the stock market for the course of a decade or a couple of decades, well, what we've seen happen through the last century is that the stock market has gone up despite market crashes, despite recessions, because we've seen a market crash or recession pretty much every decade for the last century. And yet the stock market has still risen despite every market crash and recession. And so now, if you don't know how to do the research, that's okay. You can just put your money into the stock market. There are funds that give you exposure to the S&P 500. That's the largest 500 companies in the stock market. There are funds that give you exposure to the Dow Jones. There are funds that give you exposure to the NASDAQ. There are funds that give you exposure to technology companies. There are funds that give you exposure to real estate companies. There are funds that give you exposure to international companies. So now, instead of you trying to go out and find the perfect company, you can just invest in an industry.
Now, if you want to get more involved, fine. Now you can start understanding how do you research companies? How do you analyze a company? What is a fundamental analysis? What is a company's moat? What is a company's real internal valuation? What is a company's actual profit? How much has the profit have been growing? How has the revenue has been growing? Who is the executive structure? Or what is the executive structure of a company? Now you can start digging a little bit deeper. Now maybe you're interested in that, maybe you are not. But, but depending on where you are in this investment analysis game, you gotta make your decisions accordingly, just like that with real estate. You gotta decide if real estate investing is right for you or not. I like investing in real estate. Maybe you'll hate it, maybe you'll love it. It takes more money to get started. It takes more work to get started. You gotta find the right team. You're gonna have to deal with bad property managers. You're gonna have to deal with bad contractors. Now you can get great returns, you can get great tax benefits. There's a lot of benefits to investing in real estate, but not everybody should or can be a real estate investor. It's like not how everybody should or can be an entrepreneur. Just like that with businesses. You gotta understand, well, if you don't wanna start a business, do you wanna go out and buy a business? It takes more work, takes more time, but it's not for everybody. And this is where, again, you can go deep into the rabbit hole of all the different investment options, but the key is, we just gotta get started. The reason why so many people don't become wealthy isn't because they made the wrong investment. It isn't because they have the wrong expense ratio in their funds. It isn't because they didn't do all the right analysis. It's because they are not investing. The key is you gotta just get started. Once you get started, you can start making adjustments because now you start to understand, oh, okay, maybe I want to more invest more into this. Maybe I don't wanna invest more into this. Once you have more skin in the game, you naturally become more involved, but the key is you gotta start putting your money to work. Now, in the beginning of this video, I promised you that if you stuck with me until the end, I'm gonna show you how you can get a copy of this ebook, How to Build Wealth as an Investor for Free. Now, the way you can get a copy of this is I got a link for you down in the description below, where you can go to briefs.co slash ebook, and in this ebook, we have tons of information starting with how do you build the mindset of an investor to then how do you start investing your money, different ways to invest your money, how do you generate cash flow, to then how do you spend your money smartly, to then how do you earn more money, to then how do you protect your assets because let me tell you something, they start making more money, people are going to try to take a piece of that for themselves. So there's a ton of value in this ebook. You can read it for free. All you gotta do is click the link down in the description or go to briefs.co slash ebook. And we also have tons of videos on my channel that will go over different investing things that you need to know to help build your financial education as well. If your goal is to become wealthy in your 40s and potentially retire in your 40s, it's not gonna happen by getting small annual raises and then contributing money into your 401k. Take a look. The way that anybody can become wealthy is by doing three things. Number one is you gotta spend less money. Number two is you gotta work to earn more money. And then number three is you gotta invest the difference. That's how you become wealthy. And if you wanna become wealthy sooner, you're gonna need more money that you can actually invest because you need money that's working to make you more money. Now when you have money coming in without you having to go to work, that's when you can be financially free and retire because now you have enough income from your assets to cover your lifestyle. And if you wanna have this financial freedom sooner rather than later, you need more money today going out to earn you more money. And what I want to do today, right now, is I want to go over seven practical steps, things that you can do right now, that way you can achieve this sort of financial freedom, this retirement, this wealth, whatever you want to call it, sooner rather than later, maybe even as soon as your 40s, if you start in your 30s, maybe even 20s, if you start putting these things together. And I want to get very granular about practical things that you can start doing right now. Number one is do not finance or lease your car. Buy a car with cash that we don't have to worry about the payments and take the money that you're no longer having to send into your car company, that you no longer have to pay in the expensive insurance, that you no longer have to spend in the premium gas, that you no longer have to spend in the expensive maintenance and invest that money instead. The average new car payment today is over $700 a month. Take the $8,000 that you had to put as a down payment on your $50,000 car and buy a car with the $8,000. Find yourself a used but good working condition Toyota Corolla. This will get you from point A to point B. It will not have as many issues, assuming you buy a good working condition car. And now you got a good car that will take you to where you got to go. And now you're going to free up a lot of cash flow every single month that you can use just to build your wealth. Remember, if you want to become wealthier sooner, you need more money going to your investments. That way you have more money building you wealth sooner rather than later. Number two is live smaller. Have a smaller home. This could be whether you own a home or rent a home. It really does not matter. You don't have to own a home, you don't have to rent a home, but you have to live smaller. You know, they say if you go to a realtor, if you go to a bank, they're going to give you somewhere between 28 to 33% of your gross income 
going to your housing payments. If you really want to become wealthier, you want this to be closer to 20%, where now your housing costs are significantly a smaller piece of the amount of money that you're bringing in. That way now you have more money to put towards your investments. Now, again, this isn't very fun. You might be able to qualify for a half a million dollar home, but you're only living in a $300,000 home. And the reason why is because you don't want to live so big. When you have a bigger home, well, you're going to have more expensive utility bills because you got more space, you got to heat, more space, you got to cool. You have more expensive maintenance, more expensive upgrades. Well, when you have a smaller home, your costs also get smaller and you have less money going to the bank or your landlord every single month. And that means more money sitting in your pocket. Again, this is not the most fun thing to do, but if you really want to become wealthy sooner rather than later, you got to go through what I call the decade of sacrifice doing the things that nobody else is willing to do. That way you can have the wealth that most people dream about having, but you're going to have to put in the sacrifice and the work in order to do that. And the most accessible place for you to do it is your car and your home, because those are the biggest expenses for the average person. And so now if you can reduce the size of your biggest expenses, we can have big extra savings that you can use to building your wealth. And 10 years from now, you will have way more wealth, way more financial freedom because you put in the sacrifice right now. And so if you want to have the financial freedom sooner, you're going to have to make more sacrifices today. Number three, when it comes to your home, instead of buying a single family home to live in, consider going out and buying a duplex or a triplex or a quadplex, a two, three, or fourplex, because in the United States, there are some special regulations out there which say that when you go out and get a primary residence, a primary residence can be a single family home, but it can also be a twoplex, a threeplex, or a fourplex, which means if you go out and you buy a four unit building, you can live in one of the units yourself and your neighbors can pay your mortgage for you. Now, you still have a place to live, but you don't have to worry as much about your monthly payments because now your tenants, your neighbors, the people that live in your building are going to be paying you rent every single month. And if you do it correctly, you might not have to pay any money to your bank. You might not have any mortgage costs. You might not have any housing costs because your tenants are paying your rent for you. Now, of course, this is where you do want to make sure you talk to an attorney, but this is a very commonly and very widely understood little loophole, which will allow you to own a little rental property and have your tenants pay your mortgages for you. Now, there's a second little part to this that you can also do, which is now you have the ability to live in that property for a year and then a year and a day later, move out and do it all over again and then rent out the unit that you were living in. Because generally, you cannot rent out your own primary residence. When you go to the bank and you get a mortgage for your primary residence, the place that you're going to live, you can't the next week go rent out this property to somewhere else because it's your primary residence. Banks have different loans to investors, so you can't do that. But if you live in this property for a year and a day, then you have the ability to move out and have somebody live in your property. So now you can do what I just said. You buy a three or four unit property, you move in, you have the tenants pay for your mortgage, pay for your housing costs, or at least significantly reduce your housing costs. And then a year and a day later, if you want, you can move out and then you can have somebody else live there. Now, Hopefully, this will start generating you some cash flow, and then you can start this process all over again. So now you have the income from this first property paying for the second property, and now you're working to build a portfolio of properties as you're working to get closer to that retirement. Or if you wanted to sell the property, if you have some new equity built in there, this equity can also be sold generally tax-free depending on how much the, the profits are. And now these limits are always changing, so you want to make sure you understand that. But this is where now you can use the place that you're living as a catalyst to your wealth if you do it strategically. The fourth thing that you can do is ditch the Netflix subscription. Not so you can save $15 a month, but so you can save two to three hours of your time every single day. There was a study recently put out that said that the average American is watching about three hours of television, aka Netflix, a day. Not a week, a day. Now, the reason why so many people struggle with making more money is they feel like they never have more time. And you don't have the time if you're always watching TV. And this is where now, if you can cancel the Netflix subscription, you got this new block of time, one hour, two hours, three hours to do something. And what I want you to do is start by learning. Learn how to increase your income. 
Learn how to invest. Start spending the time reading books. Start spending the time watching educational YouTube videos. Start spending the time watching educational, listening to educational podcasts. And then start spending the time doing something to earn more money. Because right now, if you want to be able to achieve that financial freedom sooner rather than later, remember, you got to spend less, earn more, and invest like crazy. The more assets you own, the more freedom that you're going to have. How can you own more assets? You can either spend less money or you can earn more money. You got to have a margin with what you bring in and what money leaves. And so one way to have a bigger margin is by earning more money. And in order for you to earn more money, you got to be learning. And you can't learn unless you have the time. So right now, get rid of the Netflix subscription. Yeah, I know you want to watch whatever shows are on Netflix right now, but this is that time. You want to go through that decade of sacrifice so you can have the wealth that nobody else has where you're going to have to do the things that nobody else is willing to do. And that means giving up some of that TV time that we have more learning time, that we have more earning that can buy you more assets. So use your time to learn how to earn that we have more money coming in. This brings me to number five, which is actually now go out and work to earn more money because now your learning will help your earnings. So now when you start learning, you can start spending this time also in your evenings and your weekends and your holidays now working to earn more money. This can be either as a contractor, as a freelancer, as a new business that you're working on, as a second job that you're working on, that way you're working to earn more money. But the key here is when you're working to earn more money, you're not working to earn this money to drive a faster car. You're working to earn this money. That way now you have more money buying you more assets. Because if your goal is to retire in your 40s, if your goal is to have the financial freedom in your 40s 10 years from now, you need to own more assets, which means you got to get laser focused on just accumulating and buying the assets. Again, this is not easy. It's not fun, but it is very exciting when you start getting closer to that goal because then you're going to have a lot more freedom. And if you're willing to put in the sacrifice that nobody else is willing to do, you can have way more freedom than most people dream about having. And this is where right now you're going to have to work to earn more money. That way you have more money to buy more assets. You go through this like hockey stick curve where you're going to put in all this work in the beginning. No one's going to recognize it. No one's going to see it. Even you are not going to see any of the great gains. Even you're not going to see any of the returns. And you're going to wonder where all your time is going, where all your efforts are going, where all your money is going. But then slowly, you're going to start to see a turn. And as you start to see a turn, you kind of see this hockey stick growth where, oh yeah, now everything's starting to compound. Your education is starting to compound. Your earnings are starting to compound. Your investments are starting to compound. And that's what you need to be working for is right now staying focused on spending your time, spending your money, and spending your energy working to build that wealth. And that wealth is through the right assets. Number six is do not get flashy with your investments because now what's going to happen is you're going to be working hard to put money aside to accumulate these assets and then you're going to see the cool and flashy and exciting opportunities come your way. Maybe it's a meme stock. Maybe it's the next hot cryptocurrency. Maybe it's a no money down real estate deal. Maybe it's the next hot stock. But this is where you have to stay consistent and remember that if it seems too good to be true, well, it probably is. There's always going to be bubbles forming. There's always going to be the next exciting investment. There's always going to be the next speculative investment. And they have the potential to 10x your money very quickly. But if you really want to build that sustainable wealth, you need your money going into places that are actually going to give you returns instead of gambling your money. Gambling can make you a lot of money but it can lose you that money just as fast. And now when you're working so hard to get that money and keep that money, you want to protect it and grow it and nurture it and not just throw it into something that is very speculative and hypey. And this is now when you're working to learn about where you should be investing. You're working to keep up to date with what's happening in the financial news. You also got to be careful to not get bogged down by all the emotions in the traditional financial media because, well, there's a lot of emotions out there. So you have to be able to cut through the noise. And the best way to do that is by reading the press releases, reading the raw data that we actually understand what's happening. And the next best way to do that is to join something like Market Briefs, which is my free financial newsletter where my team is working every day to break down what's happening in the top financial news. That way you can keep up to date on what's happening, when it's happening, without all the emotion, without all the sensationalism. You can read it in less than five minutes every morning and it's completely free. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. And I also got the link for you down in the description below. And finally, the seventh thing that you need to do if you want to become wealthy sooner rather than later is you got to forget what other people think. Look, the world are critics. People are haters. People will judge, period. Whether you're on the internet, not on the internet, well, people are going to judge you 
If you decide to do something different or not do something different, people will criticize you. If you decide to become wealthy or not become wealthy, people will hate what you do. So you might as well give people a good reason to criticize, hate, and judge you. That way, you can actually have that financial freedom. Now, here's the thing. People will always have an opinion. It goes to as simple as the financial news talking about how the world is going to end or how nothing bad will ever happen. But when it comes to you now working on building your financial journey, one of the most difficult parts of becoming financially successful, which most people don't talk about, is all the criticism that you're going to have to deal with. Whether you're an entrepreneur or not an entrepreneur, you're going to have to make sacrifices. And those sacrifices will come with sacrifice. And that means people are going to look at you like you lost your mind. When you go from the BMW to the Toyota Corolla, people will look at you like you lost your mind, as if something went wrong, as if you're on the verge of bankruptcy, as if you lost your job, as if something stopped clicking in your brain. When you stop going on those vacations to Cancun, people are going to look at you like something's wrong. When you stop spending money at Gucci and Louis Vuitton and you start wearing regular clothes at Walmart, people will wonder what the heck is going on. When you stop eating out at restaurants and you start cooking food at home, people will wonder what the heck is going on. And then they're going to start criticizing. And then they're going to start talking behind your back. They're going to tell your friends, oh, I think something's wrong at their home. I think they're having financial issues. I think that they're having some marital issues. I think they're having some other problems. I don't know what's going on. He's not as fun as he more. He doesn't really care about having fun. All he's cared about is money. He's this money-hungry person. She is this money-hungry person. People will talk. People love talking. It's what they do. So this is where you might as well give people a good reason to talk because then you go through this decade of sacrifice and then you're going to come out with the fruits of that decade of sacrifice, which is now you'll have the ability to have a much bigger and nicer home. You'll have the ability to drive a much nicer and fancier car. You'll have the ability to have the nicer and more expensive vacations. But in order for you to get there and be able to have those nice things without having to worry about the money, you got to be willing to put in that sacrifice and go through all the criticism, go through all the hate, go through all the judgment, and not worry about what they think. This is where you got to build your team, and your team is your house. you got to talk to your spouse, your husband, your wife. you got to talk to your kids and lay the foundation of what's going on and know that this is a part of it that you're going to be making some sacrifices, that people are going to criticize you for what you do, but you're working for something bigger, and most people don't understand what that bigger is. But if you stick with it, that's what's going to give you the opportunity to have the financial freedom that nobody else has. And everyone's going to wonder then how you did it. If you want to never stress about money again, the first thing you need to do is not ask for a raise. It's you got to stop working so hard to make somebody else rich but not the way that most people think. Let me show you. Let's assume that you make $50,000 a year. The first thing that's gonna happen is you gotta send $10,000 to the IRS for your taxes. That means you have $40,000 left to spend for yourself. $40,000 a year is about 3,350 bucks a month rounded up. Now, you gotta pay for your expenses. The first thing you gotta do is pay for your housing costs. $1,500 a month for your rent. Then you're going to have to pay another $300 a month for your health insurance, another $300 a month for your utilities, things like your internet, your heat, your electricity, your phone bill. Then you're going to have to pay another $500 a month for your transportation. That's things like your car payment, your insurance, your gas. Then another $500 a month for your fun money. That's things like going to the movies and travel and eating out and shopping. And then another 250 bucks a month for your food and groceries. Now, if you look at these numbers, what you see is none of these are very outlandish or crazy expenses. But if you do the math, this is going to leave you with zero dollars left over at the end of every month to build your savings. It's going to leave you with zero dollars left over to build your investments. And it's going to leave you with zero dollars left over to pay for your student loans or your credit card debt or to fund any emergency. Now, when you look at a financial statement like that, it can look very scary, like, holy crap, how can somebody blow all their money so fast and so easily and not have any money left over to make themselves wealthy? But what you'll see is that the majority of Americans are doing this, living paycheck to paycheck every single month with no money left over to make themselves rich. And this is why the majority of Americans have no money to protect them, not even a little bit against a little emergency. And that's why for most people, if a little emergency happens, they end up in credit card debt. And so this is where now you got to understand, how do you break out of the system? And everybody here says, if you just got a little raise, if you could go from $50,000 a year to $60,000 or $70,000 a year, now all of a sudden, you're going to have the ability 
to have way more money to save and pay down your debt and start investing because your expenses are based off of $50,000 a year. So if you're making 60, you got a $10,000 buffer. But statistically, what we've seen happen is as Americans make more money, they end up in a bigger financial hole. And that's why even the majority of Americans making over $100,000 a year are broke living paycheck to paycheck. It's not just because of how much money you make, it's what you do with the money you make and that's why you gotta stop making other people rich. And this is where most people assume that means I gotta stop working for my boss because I'm working to make my boss richer, but that's not what I'm talking about. Because if I show those numbers on the screen here again, take a look at these expenses, what you'll see is that you are working hard to make this money, you're working hard to make that 50 grand, but who's getting paid? It's not you, it's first the government getting paid through taxes, then you gotta pay your landlord or your banker through your mortgage, then you gotta pay people like your health insurance company, then you gotta pay the utility company, then you gotta pay the car company, then you gotta pay the gas company, then you gotta pay for the food and the entertainment. All you're doing is working hard to make money to give it to everybody else. You're working hard to generate money so you can redistribute it to everybody else. But if you really want to become wealthy, you got to change what you do with your money. And that means you got to stop making other people rich and you got to use your money to make yourself rich. See, most people are working hard to make money so they can make other people rich, which means they're working hard to get paid so they can look like they're rich. Because now if you're working hard to get paid and then you give this money to Gucci, you give this money to Lululemon, you give this money to Amazon, you give this money to BMW, you look like you're rich. You look like you made it. You have all the nice stuff and this is what's normal. In fact, what's normal is to go out and spend more money than what you're generating through your credit card, through buy now, pay later, or as I like to call it, broke now, broke later, to use home equity lines of credit and other forms of debt to spend money you don't have to buy things that make you look rich. But now what you're doing is you're spending tomorrow's income to buy something that's losing money. Because what is debt? It doesn't matter what type of debt you're using, whether it's credit cards or whether it's buy now, pay later. What is debt? Debt means you're spending your future income today. You're using tomorrow's income to spend it today. But what you're doing when you're going out and buying these things is you're using your future income to buy something that's losing value. So when you go out and you finance that BMW, you're using tomorrow's income to buy a car that's losing value. And then you gotta pay interest on top of that because your BMW is losing value. When you go out to finance the Gucci or the vacation or the nice stuff, all these things are dropping in value and you're using your future income to pay for that today. You're using tomorrow's income to look like you're richer today. But what you end up doing is making your banker richer tomorrow. You're making the Gucci richer today. And if you want to stop worrying about money, the first thing you got to do is not try to get more money because that ends up making you broker most of the time. You got to now work to make yourself rich. And that means you got to stop with all the spending. You got to stop giving all your money to everybody else. You got to stop with the redistribution of your wealth. You got to keep that wealth for yourself if you want to start getting rich. So how do you do that? Well, if you break this down step by step, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. So you might want to stop this video and watch this part again. But if you really want to build wealth, the very first thing you got to do is you got to give yourself a $2,000 cushion. You got to save $2,000 as fast as possible. Then the second thing you got to do is you got to pay down your high interest debts, your credit card debts, and your payday loans as fast as possible. These two things you need to do as fast as possible because these are the time you're in your danger zone. Because if you don't have $2,000, if you have credit card debt, these things are keeping you back from ever becoming financially free. They're keeping you back from ever becoming wealthy because you're digging yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into a hole because anytime something small happens, you just keep going further behind. So you need to do these two things as fast as possible. If you don't got $2,000 or if you got credit card debt, you should not be watching Netflix at nighttime. You should not feel comfortable sitting there watching Netflix because you got to get out of this financial danger zone first. The third thing you got to do now is you got to track your money. Get a Google sheet, get a piece of paper, get a spreadsheet, doesn't matter, and write down how much money you're making, where you're making your money from, and then below that, write down all of your expenses. And I know this one can be a little painful to do because one, it takes a little bit of time, but then you gotta actually look at how you're spending your money. But you gotta write down where all of your money is going. Look at your credit card statements, look at your debit card statements, look at your bank statements, write down all of your expenses. Then I want you to write down how much money you saved, if any. How much money did you invest, if any. How much money did you give to charity, if any. You gotta know where your money's going. 
And as soon as you do this, immediately, I can guarantee you're going to look at this and say, holy moly, I cannot believe how much money you spent at Lululemon, at Benihana, at Amazon, or wherever. And that's going to make you want to start making some changes. It's hard to do this, but you got to do this if you really want to start building that wealth and stop worrying about money. The fourth thing you got to do now is you need to start creating a system for your money. Because what most people do is they make $100 and they spend $100. Or actually, they make $100 and then they spend $120 with credit. But what wealthy people do is they have a system for their money. They know that if I make $100, here's how much I'm allowed to spend. Here's how much I invest. Here's how much I save. If I made $100,000, here's how much I'm allowed to invest. Here's how much I invest. Here's how much I save. Most people have no idea what they would do if they earn more money like that. And you have to create this system that we know what to do when you get more money. So a simple thing that you can follow is something like a 75, 15, 10 plan, which says that for every dollar that you earn from here on out, 75 cents is the maximum that you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum that you invest. 10 cents is the minimum that you save. Now, no matter how much money you're making, you're working to make yourself rich first because you're not spending all of your money. You're not redistributing all of your money. You're using some of that money to make yourself rich because that's where real wealth is built. The fifth thing that you got to do is you got to get your spending under control. That means no more 0% APR, no more financing liabilities, no more going into debt to buy things that aren't making you any money. And you can consider paying down some of your lower interest rate debts, things like your mortgage, things like your car payment, depending on what your financial goals are. Some of you, it might be, I'd rather invest my money. For some of you, it might be, I just want to get out of all of my payments. And so once you get here, that's when you can start making those, those tougher questions and start asking those questions and answering those questions. The sixth thing that you got to do is now you got to fuel the system. Now you got to start figuring out how you can earn more money. Notice that if you start earning more money first, what happens? You spend more money because banks look at you as a more credit worthy person. So most people will make more money and then they spend more money. That's why when most people go from $50,000 a year to $60,000 a year, they don't see any more wealth. In fact, they just see more liabilities. And that's where now you got to understand the controlling of your spending before you start worrying about how can you control your income. Now, once you understand this, this is where your income becomes more powerful because now you know what to do with the income and you're making more money not to drive a faster car. You're making more money to have more assets to accelerate your wealth. Now, how do you earn more money? Where to get a raise, where to get a promotion, where to get a bonus, maybe you get a second job, maybe you get a career change, maybe you get a certificate, maybe you work to start a side hustle, maybe you work to start your own business. It doesn't really matter what you do, but it's what you do with the money that matters because now you're working to earn more money to make yourself rich instead of everybody else. No more of you redistributing your wealth. You're going to use your wealth to make yourself rich. And number seven is you got to protect your assets because as an attorney, who is not your attorney, what I can tell you is when people realize you have money, they're going to try to take some of your money for themselves. So this is where you want to start investing in good advisors, a good tax advisor, a good attorney, good planners to help you protect yourself legally, financially. That way, when people come after you, because they will come after you, you have the right protections in place. Now, if you want to learn more about how to do all of this, we have a free ebook at Briefs Media, which is my company titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor that'll walk you through how to do each one of these things step by step. And it even goes over how to build the mindset of an investor, the different ways that you can invest your money, how you can generate cash flow. This ebook is completely free. So if you want to read this ebook for free, start learning and start building your financial education, I'll I'll put the link to how you can download this ebook for free down in the description below, or you can go to briefs.co slash ebook. That way you can keep learning. But the key here, I'm going to go back to what I was talking about in the beginning of this video. If you want to stop worrying about money, if you want to stop stressing about money, if you no longer want to have to worry about how you're going to make your next payment, you got to stop making everybody else rich. This one is hard because you assume that you're living a lifestyle where you can't cut back. But that is going to be the first step to breaking out of this because you have to start using your money to make you money. Because what wealthy people work to do, which is different than what broke people and everybody else works to do, is wealthy people work hard to earn money to buy things that make them money. They're working hard to make money so they can make more money. Broke people make money to look like they made money. It's a very different way of thinking. And the reason why so many people won't do this is because they don't see the results quickly. Because when you start investing your money tomorrow, you're not going to see that wealth tomorrow or next week or next month or even next year. And this is where people say, I've been working so hard to invest my money for 18 months, but I haven't seen the returns that I was hoping for. I'm just going to go out and enjoy my life. But this is why I call it a decade of sacrifice. Because if you're willing to put in a decade of you living smaller and earning more so you can invest more aggressively, you are going to have the ability to create a whole new stream of income and a whole new side of wealth 
that you didn't even know was possible. And that's why most people won't do it because most people want to have the nice things today. We want to have the fast stuff today. We want to have the nice stuff today. We want to look like we made it today because who would want to be rich when they're old? I'd rather be looking like I'm rich when I'm young. But you're not going to be young forever. Eventually, you got to pay that bill. And if you want to stop worrying about money, you got to understand that becoming wealthy is a lifestyle. It's not something you do for two days. Like if you were going to train to run a marathon, you don't do it for two days and expect to be able to run a marathon. You live a healthy lifestyle. You change how you eat. You change how you train. You start working out better. You start running a little bit. It's a change of lifestyle. Versus the people that say, you know what, I just want to lose 10 pounds for this wedding. They might lose 10 pounds in the three months. And then three months later, they gain the 10, 15 pounds. Why? Because after the wedding happens, you go back to Krispy Kreme and you start stuffing your face with donuts again. But if you want to live a healthy lifestyle, that's how you lose the weight and keep the weight off. It's the same thing with your money. You got to make that real decision of what type of person you want to be. Do you want to be a financially fit person or do you want to be a financially broke person? And you got to start. It starts here. Not by earning more money. It starts by controlling the spending. It starts by not making everybody else rich. And if you can start doing that, then you start controlling how you use your money. You start using your money to buy assets that we can make more money. Then you start getting more money. And now there's a lot of ways you can earn more money. Go out and start a business if you want. Go out and get a career change if you want. Go out and get a second job. It doesn't matter how you're earning more money, but you're earning more money now. That way you have more money to invest and start building more wealth. And if you stick with this and you keep learning, you read books, you watch YouTube videos, you listen to podcasts, maybe take some classes, in six months, you're going to see a completely different world. And in six years, you're not going to recognize yourself financially. But it takes that discipline to keep coming back when everybody else is running around posting on Instagram how they just bought themselves a brand new BMW, how they just got a brand new Gucci handbag, how they're just showing off how broke they are. You got to be the person that's slowly building your wealth. And then pretty soon, you're going to be able to buy all that nice stuff and not have to worry about the money because you're not going to be working hard to get paid to buy that stuff. You're going to have your assets, your investments working hard to buy you the car, to buy you the Gucci, to buy you the Amazon, to buy you the Louis Vuitton, to buy you the whatever you want. Now you don't got to worry about the price. If you are looking for some simple ways to save an extra thousand dollars quickly, you are in the right place. What we're seeing happen right now is that more and more people are running out of money as credit card debt is rising and the majority of Americans do not have $1,000 saved up. Now, the thing that you want to understand about this is if you don't have $1,000 saved up, I like to say $2,000, but if you do not have $1,000 saved up, you are in a financial danger zone because if any little life thing happens, happens, you're going to end up deeper in credit card debt. You're going to end up in a deeper financial hole, and it's going to make it many times harder for you to dig yourself out and actually start building wealth. So what I want to do today is go over 10 different steps or 10 different hacks that you can use to save some extra money that we can put aside at least a thousand dollars. You want to have at least $2,000 saved up, but in order to have $2,000, you got to have your first $1,000 saved up. You need to put aside at least a thousand dollars that we have some financial cushion to protect you against life's emergencies. So to start, let's start by talking about number one, which is no more financing anything, period. The difference between a broke person and a rich person when it comes to spending money is a broke person says, oh, I can make the $50 a month payment so I can afford to buy that cell phone. A wealthy person says, I can afford to buy that $1,000 phone so I can actually afford it. It's two very different things. Being able to make the monthly payments is not being able to afford it. And we live in a culture today where financing things is very normal. In fact, paying outright cash for something like a phone or a car is considered abnormal because the majority of people are now financing everything in their lives and now thanks to buy now pay later or as i like to call it broke now broke later it has become even easier for you to finance things like your clothes and even your groceries so now if you don't want to be like the majority of people who are broke who don't have a thousand dollars saved up you can't keep doing what the majority of people do and that means for one you have to stop buying things that you cannot afford. That means you have to stop financing things in order to buy them. And that means you're going to have to make some sacrifices. That means, number one, maybe you don't get to buy all the stuff that you thought you can afford. And number two, when you go to actually buy the stuff, maybe you don't buy the newest and nicest thing. If you want to buy a phone, okay, maybe you can't afford a $1,000 phone. Maybe you have to go out and purchase a $200 used phone. 
And this means now you're going to have to downsize not just what you're buying, but how many things that you're buying because you can no longer keep financing things that are not putting money in your pocket. And that means you're going to have to start spending money on less things and buying less stuff. Number two is stop paying dumb fees. This one's going to come off harsh, but you need to understand this. Banks love it. They love it when you are financially stupid. And the reason why is because if you're financially stupid, you're going to go and spend money that you don't have. Now, if you spend money you don't have, not only are you going to have to pay interest on that, we talked about that point number one, but then number two is you're going to have to pay overdraft fees and you're going to have to pay other penalties and fines, which are free money for banks. That means you're going to have to pay money because you spent money you didn't have, not just an in interest, but because you didn't have that money in your bank account. And these dumb fees are making banks, not millions, but billions of dollars each and every single year. And the reason why so many people are paying this is because they don't realize that they're spending money that they don't have. And so what you can do now is number one, control your spending, and number two, check your bank account, and number three, if you do accidentally overspend on your bank account, what I want you to do is call up the bank and tell them, hey, I accidentally overspent. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. I've had a good record with you. Can you please waive my overdraft fee? A lot of people are paying overdraft fees when you can just ask for it to get waived. And guess what? Most banks will waive your first overdraft fee for you, sometimes even the second. So just ask. The worst they can say is no. And so now, if you want to stop overpaying on fees, the first thing you can do is stop paying this overdraft fee. The second thing I want you to do is... If you are paying money to cash your checks, stop doing that. Open up a bank account. And the reason why I bring this up is I used to guest teach in Detroit public schools. And these high schoolers who were hardworking kids, many of them were working jobs and they did not have a bank account, which meant they were getting paid with a physical check. Then they would take this physical check to a liquor store to cash the check. And then the liquor store owner would charge them a 1% to 10% fee to cash that check. If you're paying money to access your own money, there is a problem here. And there's a simple and free way to bypass that. And that means go and open up a bank account for free and then use that bank to cash your checks or deposit your checks. That way you don't have to keep paying money to access your own money. The third dumb fee that I want you to stop paying are payroll advance fees. This has been a booming industry recently with payroll companies, pay loan companies, a bunch of different types of companies now extending you your payroll advances for a teeny tiny little fee. And all that means is instead of you waiting until Friday to get your money, you can get your money on Monday or you can get your money a week in advance and just pay a little bit of money in fees. But these fees compound. And if you look at how much these fees actually cost on an annual basis, it is more than what your credit card is costing you. In fact, sometimes it's multiples of what your credit card is costing you in APR. So what I want you to do now is understand you got to wait until your paycheck if you want to go out and spend that money. And that means you got to start controlling your money and controlling your spending until your next paycheck because that's going to allow you to keep way more money in your account because if you get into this habit of constantly spending next week's paycheck today, well, you're going to start digging yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into a financial hole that can get harder and harder to get out. And the fourth and last dumb fee that I want you to stop paying are late fees. Late fees really, really irritate me. And the reason why they irritate me is because they are a fee that you're paying for no purpose. You're getting no additional value. You're getting nothing except you forgot to pay a bill on time. And because you forgot to pay a bill on time, you got to pay an additional 35 bucks just because you are late. So what I want you to do is get in schedule with your bills. Look at what you got to pay. Put it in your Google calendar if you need to. Put a sticky note on it. Put it on your forehead. Put it on your fridge. I don't care where you put it. Just pay your bills on time. And if you make a mistake, because I've made mistakes as well with late fees, you better call them up and tell them, hey, I'm sorry, this has never happened before. Can you please waive my late fee? A little tip here when you're talking to customer service reps is be nice. Because if you're aggressive and angry and upset with them, they're going to be aggressive and angry and upset with you, and they're not going to be very nice to your wallet. Customer service reps are dealing with angry and upset customers all day and night long. So if you're nice to them, they will be nice to your wallet. But just explain to them that you made a mistake. Because mistakes happen. That's a part of life. But that doesn't mean you necessarily have to pay for that mistake. If you're nice, 
Many times they will waive that fee for you. Now you get to keep more money in your pocket. The third thing that I want you to do if you do not have $1,000 saved up is you got to stop eating out. Now, I want you to understand this. The goal isn't for you to not eat out and eat restaurants and eat Starbucks for the rest of your life. But there is a time and place to make that sacrifice. If you do not have $1,000 in your bank account, you should not be seeing the inside of a restaurant. You should not be walking inside of Starbucks unless you're going there just to hang out with somebody else and not eat. Now, I took this to an extreme for a long time because what I used to do was I did not want to spend money at restaurants because I wanted to keep that money in my pocket. So what I used to do was I would go to restaurants with my friends, sit there and drink water, and that's it. And so if you want to now start saving some of that money, stop overpaying by going to a restaurant. Stop overpaying by going to Starbucks. These things are entertainment. And if you don't have $1,000, and really, if you don't have $2,000, you should not be worried about entertainment right now. What you got to do is you got to get that $2,000 saved, but you need the $1,000 first. So let me stick with that, which means you cannot be going to restaurants. You should not be going to Starbucks. You should not be spending your money on this type of entertainment until you are out of that financial danger zone. Number four is no more shopping. That means no more going to the mall. No more going to Macy's. No more going to Amazon.com. Block that website if you need to. Do not go out and spend money because right now, again, you are in a financial danger zone. This means you got to keep as much money in your pocket as possible. That way you can save up this $1,000 and then the $2,000. But the fastest way for you to do that is just to stop letting this money leave your account. And that means you're going to have to stop shopping. If you do not need it to survive you should not be spending money on it. And needing something to survive doesn't mean that you shouldn't eat blueberries. It means you shouldn't be eating the organic blueberries right now because right now you got to get that $1,000 saved up as fast as possible, which also ties into point number five, which is the 24-hour rule. This is something that I like to talk about, which is if you go somewhere and you see something that you feel like you really want, something that you feel like you really need, but you're not sure yet, one thing that you can do to stop those impulse purchases is follow what I like to call the 24-hour rule, which is give yourself 24 hours to decide if you really need it. You'll go to the store, you find a sweater that you really like, but you don't buy it. You got to follow this 24-hour rule, which means you got to give yourself this discipline, which says now, I'm not going to buy this sweater today, but I'm not going to say no to buying it. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go home and I'm going to sleep on it. And then if tomorrow I wake up and I still realize I need that sweater, I want that sweater, then I'm going to make it okay for me to go out and purchase it. This way, you're not saying no to all purchases, but you can slow down your impulse purchases because maybe you're going to forget about it. Maybe you realize in the morning, you know what? I don't want to overpay for that sweater. Maybe I can wait next month. Maybe I can wait a few months. Maybe I don't need a sweater. And this way you can cool down those impulse purchases because impulse purchases are an easy way for you to find an easy extra few hundred dollars a month because everybody is making impulse purchases. And if you can cool those down, it's going to increase your bank account. Number six is stop overpaying for things. There are a whole bunch of extensions on the internet that are free Chrome extensions, free Google extensions that if you download them, they will automatically find coupons when you're shopping online. And it's the same thing when you go to stores. There are platforms, there are apps out there. I'm not going to go through which ones because there are so many and they're changing all the time. Just do a quick Google search. There are so many apps out there that will find coupons for you. My wife loves doing this. If we're going shopping in the mall and we're standing in line, what she'll do is she'll just go to Google and search Macy's coupons or whatever we are. And what you'll find sometimes, right? a lot of times, is there are 10% off coupons, 15% off coupons that are just there that if you spend 30 seconds looking for them, you'll find this little coupon. And now instead of paying $100, you spend $90 or $85 just because you spent those 30 seconds while you're in line looking for a coupon. So don't overpay for things if you don't have to, because if there's a coupon out there, use it. Number seven is negotiate your bills lower. A big difference between the spending culture in India and the spending culture in America is in India, you negotiate the price of everything. You go walk into the bazaar, you go walk into the streets and you want to buy some groceries, you're going to negotiate the price of your apples. If you go to America, you walk into whatever Whole Foods, you're not going to negotiate the price of apples. So it is not normal in American culture to really negotiate the price of things. However, you do have the ability to negotiate, especially the prices of some utility bills, things like your internet bill, things like your phone bill, things like your cable bill. Many times these service companies are going to keep increasing the price of your bill year after year after year, and they just hope that you keep blindly paying the fees. But... Many times you can save 10, 15, sometimes 30% on your bills by just calling up these companies and nicely telling them that their competitors charging a much lower rate. And you're thinking about leaving because now you're shopping around and you really want to stay and you've been a loyal customer for two years just wanting to see if there's anything they can do to work with you on the price. 
And again, when you're nice, many times these customer service reps will be nice back to your wallet, but all you have to do is ask. And it's funny, I've gotten this, this little tip has come back to me in many ways because I've gotten so many comments and messages and DMs from people saying, oh my God, Jasprit, I didn't think that this tip was going to work and now I'm saving an extra $50, $75, one person said $300 a month just by implementing this little tip. So just go out and try it. If you have these these service and utility bills, just call them and ask. You have nothing to lose because the worst thing that they can say is no. And before I move on to number eight, I do want to let you know that I know some of you are asking or wondering, how can we start putting our money to work? Well, the first thing I want you to do before you start putting your money to work, before you start worrying about investing your money and growing your money is I need you to save this first couple thousand dollars. Then I want you to focus on paying down your high interest credit card debts. After that is when you want to be worried about investing your money and growing your money. Now, for that, we have a free ebook on how to build wealth as an investor. My team at Briefs Media put this together. It's a completely free ebook that walks you through the basics of how to start investing, how to generate cash flow, the different ways that you start investing, and it gets into the advanced stuff of things like how do you protect your assets. The ebook is completely free. If you want to get a copy of this ebook, I got the link to how you can download this ebook down in the description below, or you can go to briefs.co slash ebook. Number eight is have a place to store your cash. And I do not mean under your mattress. What I want you to do is I want you to open up a bank account, not just for your spending money. If you don't have a bank account yet, make sure you open one up. But I want you to have a bank account just for your savings. This is a bank account that will keep your emergency savings cash that you only use if you run into a financial emergency. And the reason why you want to keep these separate is because what ends up happening is if you keep all of your money in one bank account is it's very easy to accidentally spend your savings money. You go to the store, you see that sale on a TV, you see the sale on a new handbag or whatever it is that you want to buy, and then you realize, oh, I got $1,500 in my bank account. I can afford or can purchase this thing. But this is where you want to make sure you keep that money separate, that we don't accidentally spend your savings money. Now, the nice thing about today at the time we were recording is that you had a lot of high-interest savings accounts that are paying 3 4 5% a year in interest on your savings. So... What you can do right now is look for a savings account, ideally a high interest savings account, open that up. And now as you start finding this extra cash, put this money there and don't touch it unless you absolutely need it. This is your emergency money because you want to use this money when something goes wrong. So you don't have to worry about going into credit card debt. But you want to make sure you keep it somewhere else and just take advantage of the higher interest rates with a higher interest savings account. That way, at least your savings can earn you a little bit of money as well. Number nine, if you want to accelerate your path to getting that extra thousand dollars, you got to get some extra money as well. And the most accessible way to do that is just by putting in some extra work. If you're working a job, see if you can put in some extra hours. See what you got to do to get a raise. See what you got to do to get a promotion. See what you got to do to get a bonus. Ask your boss. Say, boss, listen. I have this financial struggle I'm going through. I'm not asking you for a handout, but I want to put in some extra work that way I can get this extra thousand dollars. Is there something that I can do to make a little bit of extra money? And just ask. Maybe they'll say no. Maybe they'll say yes. But even if they say no, keep putting in the extra work because that way when it comes time for your raise or your promotion or your bonus, you are the person that's been putting in the extra work and the extra hours that way you can get that extra money. But the key here is now when you start making the extra money, don't keep blowing the money the way that you were before because now it's time for you to build your wealth upwards instead of digging yourself into a financial hole like you've been doing. And that means now you want to work to earn more money so you have more money to make yourself wealthy. And this brings me to number 10, which is the most different than the rest. But if you really really want to get out of the financial situation of you living paycheck to paycheck and worrying about money, the best return on investment that you can make right now is to cancel your Netflix subscription. And it's not so you can save those $15 a month. It's so you can save those two to three hours a day of time that you're watching TV. And if you really want the brutal, honest truth, if you don't have $1,000 or even $2,000 saved up in your savings account, You should not feel comfortable watching Netflix. You should not feel okay sitting down on the sofa watching TV if you are in that financial danger zone. Right now, you got to have the fire on your butt that, oh my God, I'm in a financial danger zone. I have no savings. I have credit card debt. I have these financial issues that I got to get myself out of. This is not the time for you to be sitting on the sofa trying to relax. And you might say, but just I'm working so hard at my job. I need some time to come home and relax. Fine. You want to relax? Do that after you got a couple thousand dollars. Do that after you pay down your credit card debt. Until then, you need a fire on your butt because the reality is 
Sacrifices got to be made when the sacrifices got to be made. And if you are in a financial danger zone, you should not be worried about watching TV. Now, the reason why I say canceling the Netflix is going to give you the best return on your investment is because if you can convert those two to three hours a day, and the reason why I say two to three hours a day is because the average American is watching almost three hours of television a day. If you can convert those almost three hours of TV time a day to learning time or building time, this is going to allow you to not only earn more, but build more wealth because you can use this time to read books. Use this time to watch classes. Use this time to listen to educational podcasts. If you use this time to learn, it's going to allow you to earn way more. And this is going to allow you to build more wealth because the reality is most people who earn more end up broke because they don't know what to do with their money. But now if you can start working on that financial education, you start reading the right financial education, you start absorbing the right financial education. Now, as you earn more, you're going to be able to leverage those earnings to build you even more wealth. And that's the key to becoming really sustainably wealthy and building the generational wealth is not only do you have to earn the money, but you have to know how to keep and grow that money. And there's a whole different skill set. And that's where I want you to start investing your time into that education because you have to spend your time to learn how to do that. And again, we have a free ebook at Briefs Media down in the description that can walk you through how to start building that financial education. But that requires you to put in the effort and to invest that time to actually start putting the education to work. Your money, you need to create a financial system. You need to automate your finances where now you're going to have some money automatically invested. You're going to have some money automatically saved and you're going to have some money put aside to spend. You need to know how much money you can spend, how much you should be saving and investing every single month in order for you to hit your financial goals. And the easiest way to do that is by 